Hey, we ended worship a little bit early, and I'm, I'm thankful for that because I've got about six hours worth of material. <laughs> so if you guys will turn to the very first chapter in Genesis, that'd be great. <laughs> you think I'm joking? <laughs> okay, we're going to be in Colossians 3 today, but before we get there, we're going to take a running start beginning all the way back, no joke, in Genesis 1. Uh, we're going to go to Genesis 5, and then Genesis 8, and then Luke chapter 20, I think. I should know these things. And then we'll be in Colossians. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals that live on the earth and small animals that scurry upon the ground and little doggies whose owners dress them in sweaters at Christmas time. <laughs> so God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female. Uh, he created them, then God said, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over all the animals that scurry upon the ground. Isn't that word scurry, scurry just great? <laughs> Genesis chapter five, beginning of verse one. This is the written account of the descendants of Adam when God created human beings, he made them to be like himself. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and called them human. Uh, and Adam, when Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image. You guys starting to notice the repeating theme here? When Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image, and he named him Seth. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then God blessed Noah, Noah and his sons and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, all the animals on the earth, all the birds in the sky, and all the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the fish of the sea will look on uh, with you with fear and ter terror, and also the little doggies that are dressed in sweaters at Christmas time. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for food, just as I have given, your grain, given you grain and vegetables, but you must never eat any of the meat that has, still has its lifeblood in it. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And if anyone, and anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his image. Now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. Notice an important distinction. It does not say human beings have the image of God. It says we are the image of God. So diminishing fellow human beings taking their life in any sense um, is wrong because we reflect God's image. Please turn with me to the New Testament all the way to Luke chapter 20. <clears throat> Watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the ways of God truthfully. Now, tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery and said, show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on this? Literally, whose image is stamped on this? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him in what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and they became silent. Okay. Let's look at the story real quick. Because it says, essentially, they came to Jesus and said, Who's, who should we pay taxes to? And Jesus said, you should pay taxes to Caesar because it's got Caesar's image on it. And then they're like, wow, that's brilliant, that's amazing, okay? Either we've gotten a lot smarter, or they were a lot dumber back then, or there's something else going on beneath the surface, okay? Because for Jesus to just say, yeah, pay your taxes to Caesar and give to God what is God's, um, and then they're like, wow, that's, that's brilliant, probably means there's something else going on beneath the surface here. Jesus says, give me a coin whose image is stamped on this. Ah, uh, Caesar's. Well, then it belongs to Caesar. 
He was saying that to people that were trying to trap him, who were rejecting who he is, as if to say, look at you, whose image are you stamped with? Ah, I'm created and made in the image of God. Therefore, give to God what is God's, implying it all belongs to God. Caesar belongs to God. The coins belong to God. We are created and made and stamped and mirrored in God's image. Therefore, give to God what belongs to God and give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And that's why we're here this morning, to give to God what belongs to God. Uh, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into Colossians chapter 3. Eternal God, may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, fill us with the Holy Spirit. Continue to give us grace to understand and grasp your word. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right. Toss that picture up there. I'm going to melt. And there she is. That is my seven-year-old niece, Paisley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Paisley is seven. Her sister is two. Paisley is creative, hilarious, really sweet-natured, tender-hearted, sensitive. Um, she's, <laughs> she's got a lot like me. Um, <laughs> And yeah, now she's not humble. <laughs> yeah, her little sister, Lily, um, is not yet. We'll, we'll go to the next one in a minute. Her little sister, Lily, is uh, two, and she is rambunctious and just makes a mess of everything, just goes and goes and goes nonstop. And so um, both of these girls are my brother's daughters. My brother's name is Jeremy. And so we've got Paisley being funny and creative, and then Lily being driven and energetic and rambunctious, to which I say, that's Aaron and Jeremy 2.0. <laughs> okay, next picture. And there they are together. That's Lily on the right. Uh, she's almost three, and Paisley just turned seven. Okay, now notice what they're wearing right here. About a year ago, I was visiting, visiting town, and I looked at Paisley, and she was uh, six, almost seven at the time, or she was five, almost six at the time. And I said, Paisley, wow, you are like a pretty, pretty princess. Uncle Aaron, princesses isn't my thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me, what is your thing then? And she spun around and said, cheerleading. <laughs> Hence the outfit and her little sister's <laughs> following her. <laughs> okay, thank you. You can take that down. Actually, I could just... Uh, Bye. <laughs> uh, middle schoolers do something subconsciously. Um, they don't know that they're doing it. But is what they're asking themselves, is, a, is they are asking themselves is, how am I like everyone else? And as a result of that, you'll see middle schoolers and their groups of friends together, and they're all wearing the exact same thing, uh, or dressing the exact same way. Uh, a number of years ago, there's these new socks out by Nikes called Elites. Do you guys remember those? Yeah. <laughs> At least for these socks that you wore like all the way up your thigh, and they had not really they were about you were right here, and they had little circles in the back that went all the way down, and like every junior high guy had elites, and they're all wearing them, you know. Uh, when I was younger, Timberlands. Do you guys remember Timberlands? Yeah. Anyone still wear Timberlands? Yeah. Yeah. Those those are the thing. You weren't nobody if you didn't wear Timberlands. It's like I'm wearing my Timberlands. Uh, Y'all, you want to go hiking? Nah, I can't. These are my Timberlands. These are my school shoes. Can't wear my Timberlands to go on a hike. I don't want to mess them up. And so, yeah, like, you weren't anyone if you didn't have Timberlands. And my, my family was broke, and so I was a nobody. And so um, by the time middle schoolers transition into high schoolers, the question the high schoolers begin to ask themselves is not how am I like everyone else, but they're asking themselves how am I unique. And which is why by the time you get to high schoolers, a lot of kids dye their hair. I have a friend that dyed the crown of his head purple, and underneath that, green, because he wanted to make it look like he was wearing a purple yarmulke on top of green hair. <laughs> yeah. And so junior hires, because they're re trying to reinforce their identity of who they are, dress a certain way, the same reason high schoolers do the same thing, dressing certain ways, the same reason adults do the exact same thing. We're all asking ourselves questions. We all have a certain identity that we're trying to relate to, and that comes out in how we are acting and behaving and stuff like that. Uh, by the time we get to Colossians chapter 3, Paul is addressing an issue at the Church of Colossae, and the issue at the Church of Colossae was some kind of weird mix between some cultic religion and um, like some kind of mix with Judaism, trying to snake its way into the church. 
And as what had happened is the people in Colossae were beginning to believe that they needed something other than Christ for salvation. They needed, they needed Jesus plus fill in the blank. And as a result, they were in some sense um, worshiping angels to a certain degree. Uh, they are treating their body harshly, believing that they've, if they just treated their bodies harshly, that would win them some kind of favor with God or something like that, uh, while, je- while denying and rejecting the fact that Jesus is sufficient. And so um, Paul opens up in Colossians 1, and he gives this brilliant poem. He says, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. All things that exist, exist through him and for him and to him. And he is the head of the body of the church, the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead. And he goes on and talks about uh, Jesus and how Jesus is sufficient and how he's more than enough and he's plenty. And then in chapter 2, he elaborates on issues like angel worship and people just going into great detail about what they've seen and heard to which Paul says someone that goes in great detail about what they've seen and heard has lost connection with the head, which is Christ. A number of years ago in Lakeland, Florida, there's a revival that came through and um, there's some unbelievably disturbing things that hap- were happening in the revival. The most disturbing thing that I saw, I actually saw a film of this, is the guy who was teaching the revival said, the Holy Spirit came to me and said, Quit telling the people to believe in Jesus. Instead, tell them to believe in the angels I've assigned to you. Right. Such a person has lost connection with the head. Of course, uh, anyway, the revival eventually fizzled out and all that stuff. Chapter 3. Paul talks about all, he's talking about all these different realities, heavenly bodies and stuff. Jesus is supreme over all of them. Jesus is supreme over it all because it is through him everything had been created. And so he gets to chapter 3. Well, he gets to what we call chapter 3. I don't think he's writing in chapters. <laughs> it would have been hilarious if he was. <laughs> it would have cleared things up for sure. <laughs> and he says, oh, and, he's, and he talks about, okay, Jesus died and has been raised from the dead. You also have been buried with Christ in baptism. And if you've been buried with Christ in baptism, uh, you will also live with him. Chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Every now and then, I've, I hear someone of misunderstanding this verse and essentially saying, the realities of heaven are what's important, so the realities of earth are unimportant. But if Jesus is Lord over the heavens and over the earth, then it's all really important. And we actually know that because what Paul does next is he says, set your hearts and minds on things above where Christ is seated. And then he goes on immediately and starts talking about how we should behave in the here, in the now, in the everyday life. <clears throat> he says, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ is seated at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you also will share in his glory. So, therefore, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Give to God what is God's. Have nothing to do with, and notice what he says, sexual immorality, which is uh, sexual contact outside of uh, marriage covenant, impurity, which is um, unchecked, uh, greed for more, um, um, non-covenantal sexual issues, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. He immediately goes in and starts talking about sexual issues, right? Like, um, you've been bought with a price. You're new. You know, you give to God what is God's, and he, then he lists these um, sexual temptations. And notice, notice he he lists these sexual temptations and issues to people that were already a part of the church. He doesn't say if you're doing these things, you're not a believer. He's saying live in accordance with the reality of who Jesus is and who God has made you to be. He says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking and you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Uh, there's been criticism kind of recently of the church oh, the church is, why, don't, why doesn't the church just leave us alone and quit talking about, you know, sexual issues and stuff? But here's, here's the thing, though. If we take that list and we flip it around, 
We want to be essentially the recipients of that, right? Because we don't want to be the victims of impurity or lust or evil desires, right? And so when you take this list and you flip it and say, oh, there's more going on here than just Paul saying a bunch of do's and a bunch of don'ts, what Paul is actually getting at here is that every one of us have intrinsic human dignity and human worth. We are created in the image of God, stamped with the image of God, therefore give to God what belongs to God. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> next verse. Oh, before the next verse, I'm sorry. Let's go back to the past verse. Okay. Um, another thing we want to notice here. <clears throat> um, other places in the New Testament talk about people who forbid um, sex and stuff and forbid marriage. Uh, Paul's not doing that right here. But what he actually is doing is he's saying that uh, as people, we need, to, we need to move away from being self-serving to self-giving. Look at Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Um, from self-serving to self-giving. From self-promotion to, I'm sorry, from, from, from self-esteem to Christ-esteem. Moving from self to Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. Okay, now next verse. Uh, four. <clears throat> is that right? Nope, sorry, six. Can't count. <clears throat> Because of these sin sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. But now it is time to get rid of anger, rage, malice, slander, uh, malicious behavior, slander, and filthy language. So he goes from talking about sexual issues, and then he goes to talking about issues of anger. Notice the sexual issues diminish the other person. And also words of anger and words of slander and malicious behavior, those also inflict harm on the other people. So what's Paul ultimately getting at here? We are created in the image of God. We reflect God's image. It's wrong to murder and it's wrong to diminish other human beings because other human beings reflect and mirror and are stamped and are God's image. Um, let's, also note, let's also consider the American church, church at large. Uh, you've got, we've got conservative churches. We, uh, we tend to be a little more on the, theologically on the conservative side. And uh, conservative churches tend to focus more or less on um, let's make sure that the sexual issues are being contained and maintained, right? And then on the other side of the issue, we've got churches that are more theologically liberal. And they're like, okay, let's get away from this malicious behavior and slander and, and all that stuff. The issue, though, is it's often conservative churches will prioritize one list and diminish and exclude the other list. So we'll take our torches and we'll, oh, you got to, you know, we, you know, we'll be aggressive and brutal. And then uh, the more liberal churches, they're like not aggressive and they're not, not typically not brutal. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've all got our things, right? But the, the more liberal, liberally theological churches tend to be more or less okay with sexual issues, but they stay away from, they want to stay away from harsh treatment. And what Paul is saying here is neither of those, neither of those extremes are okay. And so he's giving us these, these two lists here, these two broad categories, um, as if to say, look at all of these things here, um, all of these things, the sexual stuff and the harsh language and the harsh treatment of people, all of that stuff has to do with diminishing other people. But see, when we take passages like this, like these two categories, and we divorce them from the context in which they appear, it looks like as if Paul were being legalistic. You know, just do these and do, don't do these things. But what Paul is actually doing, um, because of these things, wrath of God is coming, verse 8, verse 9. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its, wic all of its wicked deeds. Uh, put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become more like him. Literally, uh, take out the old self and put on the, new, the nature which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. As we behold Christ and as we see God moving in the lives of our other people around us, that shapes us and it causes us to become more and more like him. Um... In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are, notice the diversity here, 
a Jew or a Gentile, okay, that's a religious diversity, circumcised or uncircumcised, uh, barbaric, uncivilized, literally Scythian, slaver free, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Notice this list. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised. So he, um, barbaric, Scythian, uncultured, slave, free. What Paul's doing here is he's saying, look, Jesus transcends everything. He's beyond all the different cultures. He's beyond socioeconomic status. He's beyond the religions. He's beyond all of these realities. He's beyond it all. And because he's beyond it all, he's over all of it. And since he's over all of it, he has the ability to do what he wants to and bring people from all different walks of life, all different ethnicities into his fold. We could very easily say it doesn't matter if you're black or white, Republican, Democrat, young, old, poor, rich. Jesus is all and is in all. It doesn't matter what your culture is, what your cultural background is. Jesus is Lord over it all. It doesn't matter how broke you are. Woo! Jesus is Lord over it all. Jesus is King. And so within this church in Colossae, they had all these things. They had Jewish people. They had Gentile people. Uh, the religious practice of circumcision and uncircumcision. Barbaric, which by the way, um, you guys ever go blah, 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 like that, you know, when you're just blah, 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 uh, yada, 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 Seinfeld reference. Um, barbarian, the word barbarian comes from um, people back then, if they didn't speak Greek, they would make fun of them by going bar, 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 by making fun of how they talk. That's where barbarian comes from. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Anyone, anyone speak Greek in here? You're all barbarians, every one of you. Okay. Isn't that William Wallace quote, I never lie, but I am a barbarian. <laughs> uh, Slaver free. Christ is, all, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So notice Paul has just talked about living well, uh, living responsibly to other people. And then he says, look at all of these cultures that are among us. Look at all of these people that are among us. When you have all these different backgrounds into the, into the same room at the same time, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> everyone's going to be fighting. You know, everyone's going to say, oh, I'm conservative economically. I'm, yeah, I'm liberal economically. I'm, um, I come from this culture. I come from that culture. Uh, look at all those poor savages over there. They don't have any manners. And look at all those snooty, rich people. They think they're better than everyone. There's all these different cultures involved. All these different cultures. And then he says, notice this, verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Since God chose you, in the Greek is plural, to be the holy people singular he loves. Since he chose you from all the different nations and cultures and nationalities to be the singular people he loves, you must, notice the clothing metaphor again, clothe yourselves with tender hearted mercy. Uncle Aaron, princess isn't my thing anymore. I dress like a cheerleader now, you know. Since we're in Christ, we must take off these old clothes of harsh treatment of people and using people and self-interest and put on the clothes of um, tender hearted mercy. Uh, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender hearted mercy, kindness, humility, humility, gentleness, and patience. Love this verse because I need it personally and I need to give it personally. Make allowances, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Let me read that again. I'm going to read it real slowly because, because I need it. Uh, make allowances, make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. You ever been offended? <laughs> what time is it? It's been six minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. Remem remember, the Lord forgave you. And subtext, since you're created in his image, you must also forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Uh, Dr. Rutland um, from Southeastern University um, he, he tells, he's got this great story. So he pastored Calvary Assemblies of God in Orlando, Florida, before he took, took over Southeastern. And he would notice this, there's these two guys that would come and sit in church. One was a really 
really, really, really old white guy. Just old as, old as Jeff Hoyle, just oh, ancient. <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> and another guy was a really, 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 really old Japanese guy. Okay. Roland found out something very interesting about these two guys. They, they, would come, they would come and sit together in church every single Sunday. These two men fought against each other in World War II. Wow. Enemies, different races, different cultures, different backgrounds, united in Christ. And with Christ being supreme over all, the great one who does not bring equality but exposes our equality brought these two men together, and they worshiped together week after week after week. They're shooting at each other when they're kids, but not the, play, not the fun, playful, you're throwing bottle rockets at your brother, like trying to kill the other person, right? And then they're both in Christ, worshiping God together. Above all, 14 still, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And... Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. 16, let the message of, about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom, with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it all as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to him through God the Father. So Paul has instructed us. He's saying, you're created in the image of God. You reflect God's image, who's beyond all. And then he says, notice this, 18. Wives, before I say this, let me just, let me say this. Paul, some people have challenges with, with these verses. Paul was an absolutely radical, radical feminist for his day. He was writing to a Greek culture, and Greek cultures believed that women were worth little more than cattle. So for him to say, wives submit to your husbands as, as fitting the Lord, he handles the husbands first because the husband's the head of the household, and he's saying, submit and respect your husband because your husband is the image of God. And then notice he says, husbands, shocking and scandalous. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Why can't I treat my property harshly? It's not your property. That person is the image of God. Any Office fans in here? Dwight Schrute, you know? Um, Phyllis, he's, he, Dwight Schrute is dancing with Phyllis, and Phyllis's husband comes and taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, may I have this dance? And Dwight says, nonsense. No need to ask to dance with what is legally your property. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you see how scandalous what Paul, I mean, that Dwight Schrute would have been a Greek. Uh, do you see how scandalous what Paul is saying? Husbands, love your wives and don't treat, treat them harshly because they reflect God's image just like you do. You are made in the image of God. You reflect the image of God. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Subtext, because they too are the image of God, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Uh, try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear for the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than people. Remember, remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master in heaven, and that the master you're serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong that you've done, for God has no favorites. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you also have a master in heaven. Masters, because your slaves are also created in the image of God, you must treat them well. I hear that voice. I would say if it ain't Jesus, don't answer it, but <laughs> it is Jesus. <laughs> okay. So we notice what Paul does here. Is he... Uh, he says Jesus is beyond all and is transcends all and is sovereign over all and he's called people from all of all races and socioeconomic backgrounds and different religions. He's called them out of all these things to bend their lives around Christ, to bend their lives around the one in who they have created. 
And he's essentially saying, look at Jesus, behold him, and as you behold Christ, he will shape and transform and change you from the inside out. <clears throat> and that change from the inside out will not only affect you, but it will affect the people that you care about and it will affect how you treat the people that you don't care about. Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote this uh, short story back in the, pretty hot off the presses actually, 1760s I think, pretty recent, somewhere around there. And he um, is, the name of the story is called The Great Stone Face. And so what happens in The Great Stone Face is, is there's this guy, a young man I think, or a teenager or something, He's traveling through town, and it's the town that's got mountains all around it and stuff, and he looks up and sees this mountain, and he sees, you know, a face in the mountains. You know, like you look at the clouds and you see a dog or something. So he looks up the mountains, and he sees that there's a face in the mountains. And you can actually Google Great Stone Face and hit image, and the, 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 the rock formation that Hawthorne based the story after, you can, you can see a picture of it. But anyway, he, um, he sees this face in the mountain, and he goes, huh, who's, uh, whose, face, whose face is that? that? That face reminds me of someone. And so he goes and stares at the face and just can't figure it out. Like, next morning he wakes up and goes and stares at the face and he can't figure out whose face this is. And he's just like staring, racking his brain, trying to figure it out. Year after year after year after year after year, he comes out day after day after day after day and stares at this face minute after minute after minute after minute, trying to figure out whose face this is, whose face this resembles. Now he's an old guy staring at this mountain. <laughs> he's, by this time, he's like the town crazy. <laughs> anyway, so he's, <laughs> he's staring at this mountain trying to figure out whose face this is. And a young poet comes into town one day and says, uh, what, what are you doing? And the, the old guy says, I'm staring at that face in the mountain trying to figure out who that face reminds me of. And the poet goes, oh, it's your face. <laughs> He had spent so much time staring at the face, he'd begin to look like it. And that's what God is calling us to do, to look at Christ, to stare, to stare into Christ, to behold Jesus. As we behold Jesus, we begin to look more and more and more like him. <clears throat> we begin to be renewed in the knowledge of the image of his creator. Uh, so therefore, let us give to God what belongs to God.